Hello students, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Anukma, Professor at Department of Economics, Punjabi University, Patiala. I am going to talk about the module New Settlements and New Urbanism from Population, Urbanization and Poverty. So students, we are going to discuss about urbanism and the principles of regions and neighborhoods along with different features of a city. The word today is urbanizing at an unprecedented rate. The faster growth of urban areas has led to congestion, heavy vehicular traffic, lesser parking space and the streets with little walkability along with various other problems of city life. The urban sapral has driven away many of the facilities to the peripheries of the cities. People have to spend a lot of time and energy in reaching to their workplaces, markets, schools, health centers, etc. Such type of city life is putting a lot of pressure on environment and affordability of routine life of urban residents. Shopping malls, fast food restaurants and office parks were placed along collector roads, roads, large blocks, and parking lots increase the number of barriers to pedestrians and automobiles and generated traffic congestion. Residential areas became isolated from each other, articulated by excessively large streets, narrow sidewalks, huge front setbacks and very few trees. In addition to these problems, Modernist roads encourage high speed and therefore accidents. The Sapral's physical structure contributes to eliminate the vitality of the public spaces and to enhance the isolation and the tedium of contemporary suburban life. Moreover, suburban Sapral depends on the use of agricultural land, therefore putting at risk the local economy. With high maintenance cost of automobiles and urban infrastructure. Therefore, the urban planners are trying to think new ways to develop and to manage a modern city which has no limits to its expansion as people are fastly moving from rural to urban areas as the economy undergoes several structural changes. These concerns of the urban planners have led to the idea of new urbanism, who idealize city to be a walkable, livable and pollution-free place. So in this perspective, this module aims to throw light on what is new urbanism, what are the basic principles of new urbanism, what are the principles for a region, the principles for a neighborhood, district and the corridor, the principles for street, blocks and its buildings. Let us define new urbanism. New urbanism is an urban design movement that originated in the United States of America in 1980s. It intends to promote a sustainable urban environment and calls for a return to the classic principles of town planning. It advocates traditional urban forms to prevent the urban sapral and inner city decline and to build and rebuild neighborhoods, towns and cities. New urbanism is an umbrella term encompassing the traditional neighborhood development or neo-traditional town planning, the pedestrians, pockets and the transit oriented design. New urbanism design principles operate on a number of scales from buildings, lots and blocks to neighborhoods, districts and corridors and ultimately to entire cities and regions. Shared principles call for organizing development into the neighborhoods that are diverse, compact, mixed use, pedestrian oriented and transit friendly. It integrates both of the perceptual, functional and behavioral dimensions with the sustainable environmental ideas. At the present time, the experts in urban design professional practice taking into account the people-related issues as a base to build cities. 
Notably, this makes livable cities based on design solutions convenient to the term of quality of life. Now we can discuss about basic principles of new urbanism. The concept of new urbanism is mainly charted and propagated by Congress of New Urbanism that is CNU founded in 1993. It emphasizes that the new urbanism should follow the principles such as that neighborhoods should be diverse in use and population, communities should be designed for the pedestrian and transit as well as the car, cities and towns should be shaped by physically defined and universally accessible public spaces and community institutions. Urban places should be framed by architecture and landscape design and celebrate local history, climate ecology and building practice. The design principles of new urbanism are based on aesthetic, environmental and functional aspects. They are structured in three levels. Number one, the region. Number two, the neighborhood, the district and the corridor. Number three, the street, the block and the building. We can easily see that a region is a larger area. Within region, we can find various neighborhood districts and the corridors and the lowest part of planning ladder are the streets and the blocks and buildings therein. The CNU has suggested nine principles for each of these three levels. Thus, there are 27 principles in all for following the strategy of new urbanism as charted by CNU. In this context, first of all, let us discuss about the region. The region has clear boundaries and encompasses cities and towns, which in turn are organized in neighborhoods and districts that are integrated by transportation corridors. Additionally, the region includes the metropolis, the cities and the town. Each one has a center and clear boundaries, establishing a relationship with the rural and natural environments. The system, suburb or city focuses on pedestrian accessibility, density and regional mass transportation. According to CNU, the development patterns should not blur or eradicate the edges of the metropolis. Infill development within existing areas conserves environmental resources, economic investment and social fabric while reclaiming marginal and abundant areas. Metropolitan regions should develop strategies to encourage such infill development over peripheral expansion. Where appropriate, new development contagious to urban boundaries should be organized as neighborhoods and districts and be integrated with the existing urban pattern. The development and redevelopment of towns and cities should respect the historical patterns, precedents and the boundaries. Cities and towns should bring into proximity a broad spectrum of public and private uses to support a regional economy that benefits people of all incomes. Affordable housing should be distributed throughout the region to match job opportunities and to avoid concentrations of poverty. The physical organization of the region should be supported by a framework of transportation alternatives. Transit, pedestrian, the bicycle system should maximize access and mobility throughout the region while reducing dependence on the automobile. Revenues and resources can be shared more cooperatively among the municipalities and centers within regions to avoid destructive competition for tax base and to promote rational coordination of transportation recreation, public services, housing, and community institutions. To succeed in efforts to develop metropolitan plans, the citizens of a region must begin by registering broad public concern about threats to natural and cultural heritage or to economic prospects. 
they must develop a consensus based upon a compelling and widely shared vision for a better future regional governments are not essential to implement metropolitan strategies yet some form of regional governance is necessary this can be provided by a civic group with powerful business or community leadership successful regions must direct most new employment and population to compact centers accessible to regional rail systems this requires improving transit networks while proposals for new or expanded highways are put on hold rail systems should focus on a vibrant 24 hour regional central business district that is cbd which must also contain major cultural educational governmental retail entertainment and employment activities they have residential neighborhoods representing all income levels with within or near the cbd preserve the historic fabric of these neighborhoods and the cbd and provide high quality public spaces and street life in this context we can easily compare a region at risk and a vibrating region from figure 2 the figure shows the interaction of equity environment and economy in two different scenarios which determine the quality of life in the region in scenario 1 the regional economy is sluggish and the income inequalities are increasing while the society is indulged in wasteful consumption of resources this results in very low level of quality of life in the region which shows that region is in risk for future growth on the other hand in a competitive region the increase in green wards mobility urban centers better workforce and better governance leads the economy to a vibrant and sustainable growth trajectory which improves the prosperity for all and a healthy regional ecosystem this raises the level of quality of life in the region such regions have the prospects of sustainable growth in future time periods neighborhood district and corridor the neighborhood is a limited area with a good balance of activities structured around a center where squares public buildings major density and urban life can be found a city is made of neighborhoods and districts articulated by corridors it possesses a main center and the other centers of neighborhoods and districts a 5 minute walking radius that is 1320 inches or 402 meters defines the size of a neighborhood districts are sectors where one use predominates the corridor is a continuous element such as a great avenue or a park that integrates and articulates the metropolitan structure access by foot is of fundamental importance to the neighborhoods as it integrates housing shops workplaces parks and civic facilities into one community the cnu principle states that the neighborhoods the district and the corridor are the essential elements of development and redevelopment in the metropolis they form identifiable areas that encourage citizens to take responsibility for their maintenance and evolution neighborhoods should be compact these should be pedestrian friendly and mixed use many activities of daily living should occur within the walking distance allowing independence to those who do not drive especially the elderly and the young interconnected networks of streets should be designed to enhance walking reduce the number and length of automobile trips and conserve energy within neighborhoods a broad range of housing types and price levels can bring people of diverse ages races and incomes into daily interaction strengthening the personal and the civic bond which is very essential for an authentic community transit corridors when properly planned 
and coordinated can help organize metropolitan structure and revitalize urban centers. In contrast, highway corridors should not displace investment from existing centers. Appropriate building densities and land use should be within walking distance of transit stops, permitting public transit to become a viable alternative to the automobile. Concentrations of civic, institutional and commercial activity should be embedded in neighborhoods and districts, not isolated in remote, single-use complexes. Schools should be sized and located to enable children to walk or bicycle to them. The economic health and harmonious evolution of neighborhoods, districts and corridors can be improved through graphic urban design codes that serve as predictable guides for change. A range of parks from tot lots and village greens to ball fields and community gardens should be distributed within neighborhoods. Conservation areas and open lands should be used to define and connect different neighborhoods and districts. Housing that is located in a walkable neighborhood near public transit, employment centers, schools and other amenities allows residents to drive less and thereby reduce transportation costs. Development in such locations is deemed to be location efficient. Given a more compact design, higher density construction and or inclusion of a diverse mix of users. Thus, housing location and proximity to transit is a major variable for household energy consumption, the cost borne by household and hence the quality of life of a particular household and the neighborhoods in general. The difference in energy use by various types of households in conventional suburban development and transit-oriented neighborhoods is shown in figure 3. As the bar graph shows, if a household moved from a single-family detached home in a conventional suburban development, that is CSD, to a house of the same size in a compact transit-oriented neighborhood, that is TOD, its energy use would be reduced by 39%. If that home included energy star energy efficiency measures and if the residents drove a fuel efficient car, then the household's total energy use would be reduced by 54% compared to the conventional low density suburban scenario. The difference is also marked in the single family attached unit scenarios. A household living in a single family attached home in a CST would use 42% more energy than one living in the same unit in a transit accessible site. If that TOD single family attached unit were 20% more energy efficient and used only one green car, the household would reap energy savings of 57% over the conventional building and location scenario. The biggest difference is seen when a multifamily home in a low density development is compared to its transit oriented counterpart. In that example, the household consumes 50% less energy annually simply by living in a compact location with convenient access to transit. If the multifamily unit incorporated some energy efficiency measures and if the household drove a fuel efficient car then that family would consume 64% less energy than a conventional multi-family unit in a low density development. Deeper examination of the graph reveals even more interesting results. Conventional non-green TOD households consume less energy that is 93 to 147 billion British thermal units or BTU per year. Then the same units in a CST using 186 to 240 million BTU per year. Even when comparing the most efficient of the conventional non-green CST households using 186 million BTUs, they still do not match the least efficient conventional TOD scenarios 
using 147 million BTUs per year. A CST single family detached house uses 93 million more BTUs per year than the same house in a TOD location. The most energy efficient housing scenario studied using 67 million BTU for an energy efficient TOD multifamily unit with a green car consumes only about a fourth of the total annual BTU of the least energy efficient housing approach examined in this study, which is using 240 million BTU per year for a single family detached household in a CST. The graph illustrates the potentially drastic differences in energy consumption rates when housing development shifts from conventional low density development patterns to a more compact transit oriented location efficient development patterns characteristics of many urban neighborhoods. The proximity of housing to transportation option plays a significant role in reducing energy consumption, household costs and greenhouse gases. Now we can talk about the streets, blocks and the buildings. The street layout must contribute to reduce the speed of the automobiles. The streets must be sided by the front facades of buildings whose entrances connect directly with them. Blind facades are avoided as the arrangements seek for a major number of transitions between interior and exterior spaces. The front setback of the buildings must be the smallest possible and non-existent in commercial buildings. The interest is to use inhabitants' natural surveillance to enhance urban safety and the street life. Pedestrians must be able to choose between different options of routes to move from one place to another. Besides the streets, there must be the alleys and the pedestrians' ways. Cul-de-sacs must be avoided. Back alleys are suitable, for example, to access garages and outbuildings. In the residential areas, there must be a minimum set of certain typologies, apartments over commercial space, apartment buildings, row houses, live work units in order to guarantee diversity of space use through time. The upper floors of the commercial buildings must be used as homes and offices, thus characterizing mixed use buildings. The parking lots must be located behind the buildings but the garage buildings take people directly to the sidewalks, promoting vitality in the streets. The CNU further emphasizes that architecture and landscape design should grow from local climate, topography, history, and building practice. Civic buildings and public gathering places require important sites to reinforce community identity and the culture of democracy. They deserve distinctive form because their role is different from that of other buildings and places that constitute the fabric of the city. All buildings should provide their inhabitants with a clear sense of location, weather and time. Natural methods of heating and cooling can be more resource efficient than mechanical systems. Preservation and renewal of historical buildings districts and landscapes affirm the continuity and evolution of urban society. UN Habitat in 2014 has suggested a simple street network model for 18 km street length per square kilometer as shown in figure. The figure shows that this model suggests that in an area of 1 square kilometer, Nine vertical and nine horizontal streets are designed to form a street network. The distance between two adjacent streets is 111 meter and the total street length is 18 kilometer. In this street network model, both street hierarchy and block size are considered. This simple model demonstrates the balance between street and other land uses. 
city management and urban planners could adjust the design pattern of the street network but a street density level similar to the one recommended in the model should be maintained apart from this model of connectivity the safety model says that the streets should have seven qualities number 1 human presence people in public space must feel the presence of other people in the space and in the buildings surrounding the space the sense that we are not alone and are being observed helps us behave properly and feel safe windows are symbols of that presence whether people are behind them or not mixed use buildings help promote 24 hour presence the second quality is that of congeniality the dimensions and scale of the space should encourage comfortable interactions among people the third one is that of human protection mechanical devices such as cameras and gates should be invisible where possible police presence should be personal on foot or bicycle so police officials can interact with others the fourth one is visibility light and openness open views that enable us to see other people and to be seen by people driving by as well as by others in the space provide natural supervision lighting should ensure night time visibility the fifth quality is that of order coherent landscapes streetscapes and signs in both the public rights of way and bordering properties make a clear statement that a space is well managed and safe the sixth quality is that of connections spaces must be perceived as part of an interconnected network of streets and public open space so we feel we have access to others who make the space safe the seventh one is that of legibility the clarity with which each space connects to the rest of the city helps us understand the form of the city keeps us from feeling lost and assures us that we are in control of our relationship with the city spaces and the people residing in them however the safety in the streets differs according to the type of the street the safety in neighbor streets requires the households with open front yards and large windows similarly the commercial streets also safe and secure if there are glass windowed store fronts which make each activity on the street visible to the merchants on the other hand the safety in civic spaces such as parks requires that the vistas should be broad enough and all parts can be seen by people in the space and by motorist driving through entrances to the buildings can be clearly marked there is ample and regular lighting trees and landscape material do not block views at eye level the sizes of buildings are in scale and the dimensions of the space to communicate its importance thus for any type of street the message for safety and security is that a correct design can prevent crime and turn street walking a safe and desirable option which has its own impact upon the sustainability of the region in general and households in particular so students let us sum up what we have learned from this module to sum up the philosophy of new urbanism offers an alternative to suburban sprawl urban decay and disinvestment single use zoning and auto only environments yet it is perhaps unique in developing an interlocking approach at the multiple scales individualized efforts at scale of the region the neighborhood or the street are necessary and important but not sufficient to bring basic change to our development patterns the charter asserts that the three scales are interactive and must be coordinated to have a penetrating effect this notion that each of them are interdependent and mutually reinforcing is the result of a new perspective 
that the significant increments of our social, economic and ecological life have shifted from nation, state and city to globe, region and neighborhoods. The dominance of the global economy, the emergence of metropolitan regions, the maturation of the suburbs, the revitalization of inner city neighborhoods and a renewed focus on human scaled environments are linked and contemporary phenomena. Although too often treated independently, each is critically dependent upon each other. So that's all with today's lecture. I hope you must have enjoyed it. Thank you.